preparing ourselves to bring you the insights from uh, the speech of the finance minister and the provisions uh, which he unveiled uh, earlier today. After a long time, we have a clear tax policy direction, uh, it seems, in the budget, in a budget speech. Whether it is the roadmap for reduction in the corporate tax rate along with rationalization of exemptions, the clarifications, the much awaited clarifications on indirect transfer tax and the deferral of the general anti-avoidance rules and also the grandfathering of uh, investments made uh, prior to April 1, 2017. The removal of wealth tax which generated just a 1000 crores but created a lot of practical, uh, uh, unnecessary practical issues. The firm commitment on GST implementation and addressing the inverted duty structure faced by domestic manufacturers. And finally, a clear roadmap on bringing in an anti-black money provision. I think it's a it's the most specific piece of legislation which has been talked about for a long time in India. We have to see, of course, uh, the the fine print, how it is worded, how do they make how do they make it uh, as uh, as uh, conducive to fulfilling the objectives without coming in the way of genuine transactions. Also some welcome clarifications on alternative investment funds and, uh, and REITs. Uh, still I think it is partial uh, as we shall discuss uh, a lot more uh, uh, is perhaps needed uh, to give full clarity on these, uh, on these issues. So with that, uh, you know, with those, with those opening remarks, uh, you know, to, to discuss the, the flowers in great detail and also some thorns which the finance minister reminded us uh, he carries forward from the previous regime. Uh, we have a fantastic panel uh, with us. On my uh, immediate right is uh, Dr. D.K. Srivastava, eminent economist and senior policy advisor of EY. Uh, he will take us to some uh, insights on the macroeconomic and tax policy scene. Uh, we will be shortly joined by Mr. Farooq Subedar, uh, who is uh, group vice president uh, of, of Tara Sons. On my left, I have my colleague, uh, partner Pranav Saita, uh, who will discuss the direct tax implications of this budget. And to his left, uh, I have my other colleague partner, uh, Uday Pimprikar, uh, who will take us to the indirect tax uh, proposals. We plan to uh, have these uh, presentations about uh, for about 45 minutes and then have a panel discussion thereafter. There are provisions made for uh, questions which you may write in and we'll try and answer them in the concluding uh, part of this, uh, of this discussion. So with that, I turn over to uh, Dr. Srivastava. Uh, uh, Dr. Srivastava, your take on, on the macro picture. Yeah. Well, the macro picture basically consists of uh, the picture on inflation and the picture on growth. Right. Now, the inflation numbers have eased and that has given uh, the government the necessary comfort to really aim at an ambitious growth rate which the finance minister has indicated could be in the range of 8.1 uh, to 8.5%. Uh, alongside uh, the implicit uh, inflation uh, rate is about 3% and here what is relevant for tax revenue growth and tax buoyancy is the inflation that is attached to the implicit uh, GDP price deflator which is slated to grow at about 3% given that CPI is expected to average at about 5 percent and WPI is actually just about 0 percent. So implicit price deflator would be somewhere in between. Now while the inflation is story is quite convincing and we think that there is a sound structural basis that we would, we would expect that in the coming year inflation would be in the range of 3 to 5 percent. Uh, the growth ambition which is of course quite justified because whenever we are faced with this low inflation rate the economy needs to be stimulated and real growth has got to be pushed up. Uh, so the growth that is being envisaged is in the range of uh, eight, uh, 8 plus percent. There has been as you know a controversy about the level of growth uh, because of the revision of uh, the growth numbers but if we leave the issues relating to the level of growth aside and look at what is the planned increase in the growth rate, uh, then we will see that last year according to the new numbers the growth rate was 7.4 percent, 
today we are talking about anywhere between suppose we take the midpoint then we are talking about an increase uh, in the growth rate of just a little less than 1 percentage point. That would require an increase in the investment rate of anywhere between 4 to 5 percentage points. Whether that kind of increase can come from what is provided for in the budget, uh, whether that is consistent with the overall investment rate and saving rate story are the issues that we need to really address as we go into the substance of the budget. And there uh, first let us look at what kind of stimulus that is to say expenditure side stimulus that has been provided for in the budget and we look, that, uh, look at uh, the non-plan and plan expenditure growth rates that have been envisaged the, while the non-plan expenditure is slated to grow at about 8.2 percent and these are nominal growth rates plan expenditure is actually going to fall or, or, or show really no effective real growth rate. So, as far as the stimulus uh, coming from central government expenditure stimulus is concerned, actually we see that the stimulus that can be provided for is extremely weak and that is so uh, because of the limits that are there on the fiscal deficit and revenue deficit targets that are there. As we know that while some space has been created because of the reduction in petroleum subsidies in the system, the fiscal consolidation path that uh, has been envisaged uh, by the finance minister indicates that he has been able to create just a very small fiscal space for himself by modifying the fiscal deficit target which uh, according to the earlier plan should have been about 3.6 percent of GDP, but he has now increased it to 3.9 percent. So, from the side of borrowing a very small scope is there for enhancing the expenditures, but the real uh, receipts that will come from tax revenues or uh, uh, from non-tax revenues are the ones that, that can provide the room for increase in capital expenditure. Now, the direct increase in capital expenditure that the government can plan for can come from either revenue expenditures or capital expenditures directly. And as far as revenue expenditures are concerned, most of those will be transferred to the state governments. And uh, therefore, the room that will come for, revi uh, for uh, financing the capital expenditure is whether uh, the story that is being told about the buoyancy and growth of tax revenues uh, will come true. Now, the experience of last year is that uh, we had actually overestimated in the budget and the uh, growth rate that was is assumed was 13.4 percent, we actually got 2 percentage point less. The buoyancies that were also assumed did not come to be true. This year, therefore, the base from which we have to start has come down by something like 110,000 crores compared to the budget estimate of last year. The revised estimates are lower by 110,000 crores. On that is lower base, now once again we are plan planning for a substantial rise in terms of the tax revenue growth. Overall growth rate for tax revenues is being envisaged at 16 percent close to 16 percent. And the elements that are uh, responsible for this very largely are domestic indirect taxes. So, there the union excise duty growth rate that is being envisaged is about 24 percent and the service tax growth rate is about 25 percent with a nominal growth rate of only 11.5 percent. Can we have such high indirect tax revenue growth which uh, given the experience of last year's uh, buoyancy, uh, which actually turned out to be uh, as low as 0 0.9 for gross tax revenue, but this year once again we are planning for 1.4. These are buoyancy numbers. And union excise duty actual buoyancy was only 0 0.8, we are now planning for more than 2. Service tax, the actual buoyancy is only 0 0.75, we are now planning for 2.15.
So, the issue that needs to be asked is whether these optimistic growth numbers for tax revenue as a whole, but particularly for domestic indirect taxes are going to come out to be true. If not, we will be then repeating what happened this year. There would be a shortfall in revenues and therefore, there would be a shortfall in expenditures, therefore, there would be a shortfall in capital expenditures, therefore, the envisaged invest investment rate increase will not happen and we will actually belie the targeted right. growth expectations. So, the issue really is whether such kind of tax buoyancies will come through or not and that is why we can start discussing what is it in the union excise duties and service sure. tax that will take us to this high growth. Sure, very useful uh, Dr. Srivastava. So, we will we'll come to that again in the, in the panel discussion. Uh, so, with that uh, Pranav, if you can uh, take us through the direct tax uh, changes. Thank you sir for uh, the macroeconomic uh, perspective. From the direct tax standpoint, we wish to cover this in four clear compartments. One is we will look at the provisions proposed in relation to rates of tax. We will then move on to the initiatives in connection with the growth of the economy and make in India. We will also look at uh, the, the, the compliance easing that he is proposing to do thereafter in the budget and finally, we will look at some of the provisions in connection with the black money and how he proposes to tackle the menace of black money. Moving on straight away to rates of tax, uh, firstly there is no real change in the rates of tax for individuals as well as for corporates except the 2 percent increase in surcharge that he has proposed which we will come to. But other than that this year there are no proposed changes in the rates of tax neither for individuals nor for corporates nor even the threshold limits and the slabs, slab rates uh, for individuals have changed. Really he does however say that for the first time we are seeing here in India that he says that over the next 4 years after financial year 1516, he will phase down the corporate tax rate from the current 30 percent to 25 percent. So, no change for financial year 1516 in the corporate tax rate but from financial year 1617 onwards, the speech of the finance minister has assured that he will phase down the corporate tax rate to 25 percent. How in what steps is not very clear, nothing in the bill at least at this stage because the bill deals with provisions for financial year 1516 so to say. So far as surcharges are concerned, he does say that he will increase the surcharge by 2 percent in lieu of wealth tax which he completely abolishes. The effective rate for a company having domestic company having income above 1 crore will now be 32.45 percent because of the increase in surcharge from 5 to 7 percent. So, the base rate is 30 when you add the surcharge and says it adds up to around 32.45. In case of companies having incomes beyond 10 crores the surcharge will increase from 10 to 12 percent effective tax rate becomes 34.61 instead of 33.99 that we currently have. And similarly, in case of individuals, the highest marginal tax slab will now tax rate will now be 34.61 because of the 2 percent increase in the surcharge. We must remember that the 2 percent increase in surcharge has been made applicable even to the dividend distribution tax as well as the buyback taxes. So, it is across the board so to say education says continues at the existing rate of 3 percent and that is really what we have so far as increase in the rates of taxes are concerned. Moving on to the next batch of uh, provisions that we see in this year's budget. We call them provisions relating to make in India or provisions which deal with driving off the growth imperative that we have before us today. One he does say that taxation of business trusts, REITs and invits will be getting some further welcome SOPs. Firstly, he does say that so far as sponsors are concerned, when the sponsor ultimately sells the units on the stock exchange, we are told that he will qualify for the exemption. Earlier in the, in the initial changes that he had brought about in the Income Tax Act under the REIT provisions last year, the sponsor could not avail of the exemption when he made subsequent sale at the stock exchange. The initial contribution by the sponsor got him an exemption 
but the ultimate sale on the stock exchange was not exempt. This year's budget provisions seem to provide that when the sponsor ultimately makes the sale on the stock exchange, he will get full exemption if it is a long term uh, asset. If it is a short term asset, like for other short term gains on the stock exchange, it will qualify for the concessional rate of 15%. We must remember here, one other ask of the industry also was that the period of holding should also be brought in sync with shareholding. As we know, listed shares become long term after 12 months, whereas units of REITs in WITS become long term after 36 months. That has not been considered to, so the period for becoming long term still continues to be 36 months but the benefit of exemption will now be available to the sponsor as well if he sells on the stock exchange more than 36 months exempt less than 36 months concessional 15 percent tax rate the other concession that the budget provisions offer are that REITs will now not be taxable in respect of their rental incomes now to what extent this will really be achieved one has to wait and see because typically the structure that one is likely to see is that the REIT itself will not be earning rental incomes but will be owning shares of an SPV which in turn owns the, uh, owns the properties and therefore earns the rental incomes. If that happens the budget provisions do not give exemption to the rental income in the hands of the SPVs but if the REIT itself directly owns the property and earns the rental income then the budget provisions seek to provide exemption in respect of the rental income of the REIT itself. Of course, when the distribution is made to unit holders at that stage there will be tax in the hands of the unit holders. Of course, the reason why there might still be a structure where the REIT owns an SPV shares which in turn owns the properties is that when it comes to exemption in the hands of the sponsor himself, the original promoter the exemption is available to him for moving the shares of an SPV into the REIT but he does not get similar exemption under section 4717B when he moves assets or properties itself into the REIT. So that, that remains the clear glitch here and therefore one might still have an SPV kind of model which means that the rental exemption may not be available to the REIT itself. Moving on further if we look at the growth and make in India initiatives, we are talking of the REITs shall deduct tax when they are making payments. In case of income to non-residents, they have to withhold tax at 10 percent. Of course, finally, uh, in, in fact, to residents at 10 percent and for non-residents at the rates in force. Even in case of residents, of course, depending upon the slab rates, ultimately the income would be taxable in the hands of the concerned resident at the respective rate. Moving on further, we all know that GAR was expected to be deferred and that has indeed been announced by the finance minister. The bill now talks of a deferral by two years. So GAR will indeed become effective from 1st April 2017 instead of from 1st April 2015. Additionally, what the finance bill provides is that all investments made up to the date on which GAR becomes effective will be grandfathered. The earlier, the present provisions under the Income Tax Act talk of grandfathering investments made only up to August 30, 2010. Now we are told that grandfathering will extend right up to 31st March 2017. Certainly both are extremely welcome steps and to some extent I think it will help in terms of prom promoting foreign investments. Moving on further, in regard to 194LD, we are now told that for interest earned by FIIs and QFIs, the concessional withholding tax rate on the interest income of rupee bonds, which, which is 5%, will be extended up to 30th June 2017. So interest earned by FIIs, QFIs up to 30th June 2017 on rupee bonds will now qualify for the concessional 5% tax rate. We are now told that fund management activity is proposed to be promoted in India and we are told that if the fund manager carries out this activity in India, it will not constitute business connection and not constitute a permanent establishment in India. Certainly a very welcome initiative. Of course, we are told that 
for this purpose fund manager should be other than an employee of the fund or a connected associated person that seems to be a little bit of a glitch and hopefully some clarification on that clearly comes through uh, so one does hope that some clarification there will make this provision practically feasible but if it does becomes pra become practically feasible it is indeed a great initiative on the royalty and fts withholding tax rates in respect of royalty fts paid to non residents a couple of years back we saw the domestic tax rate being increased to 25% of course in most cases one would be governed by the treaty in which case the treat lower rate with of withholding under the treaty would have been applicable but fortunately this budget proposes to bring down the rate back to the 10% so we will now have withholding tax at 10% on royalties and fts even under the domestic law moving on further for alternative investment funds both category 1 and 2 we are now told complete pass through status is what will be assured so the only ones that remain now will be category 3 aifs which will not have a pass through status undoubtedly a good initiative what one must remember however is that we are told that if the income is taxed as business income then this particular pass through status may not apply and one wonders typically our experience has been most incomes of such aifs category 1 or 2 would be in the nature of other heads capital gain etc and not business income so what exactly was the objective behind this exclusion is not very clear indeed the other is what one must remember any distributions made by the fund to the investors is subject to a 10% withholding if therefore the investor for example was a mauritius entity qualifying for the treaty exemption and therefore not taxable at all in such cases also the way it is worded it seems that the 10% withholding will mandatorily apply that seems to be again something that needs to be addressed if therefore the investor is not taxable at all subjecting that particular distribution to a withholding will mean unnecessary have unnecessarily the investor having to file returns claim refunds which might be a considerable cash flow issue in the sense so far as the investor is concerned from a point of view of promoting and channelizing savings and social security we are told now that under the pension schemes the sub category of section 80c section 80c already allows deduction from gross total income to 1 and 1/2 lakhs now we are told that under the sub category of contribution to pension schemes which had a limit of 1 lakh the limit will now be enhanced to 1 and 1/2 lakhs the overall limit was always 1 and 1/2 lakh and stays there no change at all similarly we are told that for salaried employees contribution under the national pension scheme atccd the limit will now stand enhanced to 1 and 1/2 lakhs moving on to the next set of amendments proposed in the budget which essentially deal with curbing disputes and easing some of the compliance requirements under the law we can firstly take the most contentious one which is the provisions in relation to indirect transfers as we know this came about in 2012 and for a long time we are awaiting some clarification in regard to various ambiguities contained in the indirect tax provisions under section 9 firstly we are now told clearly that unless the value of assets in india are more than 50% of the overall value 50% or more of the overall value of the foreign company whose shares are transferred the indirect transfer provisions will not apply so for the indirect transfer provisions to apply at least 50% of the value of the overseas company's assets should come from assets in india second we are told that for small such investments where the value does not exceed 10 crores 100 million rupees again the indirect tax provisions indirect transfer provisions will not apply certainly a welcome step already some precedents and based on interpretations it was felt that the interpretation of the term substantial required that at least 50% of the value should come from india this has now been clearly specified in the bill itself 
whether it will apply retrospectively one waits to see will this be interpreted to be merely clarificatory at least the way the provision is sought to be introduced it is sought to be introduced only prospectively but given the past precedents and given the ambiguity this might be regarded as one provision which really seeks to clarify what was always intended further we are told that even if the value of the indian assets exceed 50% only a proportionate part of the capital gain arising from transfer of the shares of the overseas company will be taxable in india the proportion being the same as the value of the indian assets would bear to the total assets of course some clarity is awaited as to exact manner in which this value will be computed and so on also we are told that so far as small shareholders are concerned meaning shareholders holding up to 5% shares minority shareholders holding up to 5% shares not having any management or control rights selling shares of the overseas company will now not be liable to indirect tra transfer provisions under the indian income tax law this is again a welcome move especially because most cases of transfer of shares in overseas stock exchanges in respect of listed companies overseas will now clearly fall outside the purview of the indirect transfer provisions also there have been specific reorganizations overseas which will now not be subject to the indirect transfer provisions especially if they fulfill certain conditions foreign amalgamations and demergers will be outside the purview of the indirect transfer provisions under the income tax act a very interesting provision which is sought to be introduced is a reporting obligation on the indian company if the assets of the foreign company are in the form of shares of an indian company from which 50% or more value has been derived as we just discussed we are told that the indian company now will have, have an obligation to report this particular transaction and if it fails to do so it will be subject to a penalty of 2% of the value of the transaction now that seems quite an onerous obligation on the indian company meaning thereby that the indian company ought to first of all know that the overseas transfer has taken place the objective seems to be obvious the government probably feels that every transaction which happens abroad may or may not come to light and they might not be made aware of that transaction and therefore places obligation on the indian company to report such a transaction to enable the tax administration to do the needful of course levying a 2% penalty seems to be quite an onerous one one could say that if the indian company itself was not made aware because the control and management did not change can it be expected to report something it was not aware of at all uh, the the explanatory memoranda seems to suggest that this particular provision seems to presuppose that the indian company's management control changed and therefore it was aware but if we look at the finance bill itself it does not seem to give any such leeway to the indian company one does however expect that it is only when the indian company is aware of this particular overseas transaction that it can be expected to report such a transaction under the requirement now proposed we are told now that the precedents which if you recall dealt with a branch of a foreign bank making payment of interest to the head office not being taxable the foreign head office not being taxable on the ground that it was earning income from itself and under the normal concept of income one cannot earn income from itself or himself under that principle or concept the foreign bank was regarded as not taxable we are now told that if this amendment goes through the two will be regarded as distinct parties and the foreign bank will be chargeable to tax in respect of interest income earned from an indian branch notwithstanding the fact that it is interest earned from self of course treaty rate if it is more favorable for withholding tax in respect of this particular interest payment by the branch to the head office will be available it is also otherwise subject to a withholding tax moving on further we are told that a share of a member in an eop on which income tax is not payable by the member will now not be includeable while computing the book profits and therefore will not be subjected to mat certainly a 
clarification which helps significantly in terms of making the law clearer, less susceptible to litigation. An interesting provision which has been introduced is that capital gains earned by FIIs on the stock exchange will now not be subjected to MAD. The finance minister spoke about this in his speech as well. While this came out as a relief provision, a clarificatory provision which actually eases the burden on FIIs, one wonders to what extent this actually could be used the other way by a tax administration for the simple reason that today by and large the interpretation and practice is that foreign companies not having a presence in India in the form of a permanent establishment are not liable to MAT at all. Now comes a provision which would say that FIIs earning capital gains on the stock exchange will not be subject to MAT. Would that be interpreted to mean that impliedly in all other cases MAT actually is supposed to apply even to a foreign company? Will it mean therefore that other than FIIs, FDIs, private equity investors will be subject to MAT even though they have no permanent establishment, the foreign company earning even capital gain will be subject to MAT or an FII earning capital gain otherwise then on stock exchange will be subject to MAT or earning interest income we just said subject to a concessional 5% withholding tax rate will be subjected to MAT and so on and so forth. So quite a few questions may, might emerge because of this provision whether it impliedly means that the intent of the legislature is to subject foreign companies to MAT other than this particular specific exemption or, or exclusion which is now sought to be provided. One waits to see what happens to this provision in the bill before it is finalized. I am sure quite a few representations on this are likely. Moving on further, we already mentioned wealth tax is proposed to be abolished, certainly a great step uh, given the kind of revenues that were collected from it. It has however been replaced by a 2% surcharge. The collection because of this will actually almost increase tenfold. Instead of 1000 crores, I am told probably 11,000 crores. So that is that's a step that we discussed as well, the 2% increase in surcharge. We are told also that in order to reduce litigation, tax authorities now will be precluded from appealing on matters which have been already decided in favor of taxpayers, where an identical question of law is already pending before the Supreme Court. Again, certainly a welcome step in order to reduce litigation. Moving on further, we are now told that section 6 which deals with residence of Indian companies will stand amended and for all practical purposes a foreign company will be regarded as resident in India if its place of effective management is in India. Currently the provision is that a foreign company is regarded as resident in India if and only if the whole of the control and management is in India. Instead of that we are now told if its place of effective management is in India which is a lower threshold the foreign company will be regarded as resident in India. Of course to what extent this will have an impact on Indian companies having subsidiaries abroad and to what extent there will be a need that they clearly demonstrate that the overseas subsidiary not only has some portion of the control and management abroad but the place of effective management is abroad is something that remains to be seen. Therefore, the need now will be much greater in terms of documentation and demonstration to clearly establish the place of effective management as abroad. We are also told that the threshold limit for applicability of domestic transfer pricing will now be enhanced from 5 crores to 20 crores. Very quickly, the last part of the direct tax slide deck here we have for you today deals with the provisions which are by and large for tackling the menace of black money. What exactly has the finance minister proposed? One in 269 SS and 269T which presently deals with loans and advances otherwise then by way of uh, checks. We are told that with this will now apply even for advances given for real estate immovable properties both advances given and re received back and therefore hopefully so far as real estate transactions are concerned it will curb the impact of black money that's that's provision one 
we are also told that various punitive measures will be introduced particularly in terms of concealment of income and tax evasion firstly we are told that in case of tax evasion especially when it comes to overseas assets prosecution and punishment will result in rigorous imprisonment up to 10 years presently we are talking of up to 7 years which we are now told will go up to 10 years second we are told that these offenses will not be compoundable presently they are compoundable so we are now told they will not be compoundable third we are told that these offenders will not be allowed to go to the settlement commission and lastly that the penalty on these offenses will be 300 percent normally the penalty for concealment is between 100 to 300 percent it's discretionary we are told that for overseas assets it will now be straight 300 percent of the tax so these are pretty stiff provisions and we are told that these will be applicable immediately for non filing of return or for filing of return with inadequate disclosures we are now told that again there will be prosecution with punishment with rigorous imprisonment up to seven years and we can now expect a new benami transactions prohibition act which is on the anvil with that i'll hand it over to my colleague uday who will take us through the indirect tax provisions uday thanks for enough <coughs> uh, the present budget uh, was also uh, a bit of full of surprises some good news and some news uh, which will cause uh, some amount of anxiety uh, among some assets. Uh, to start off with, uh, let's let's start off with the big news uh, on goods and services tax. Uh, the the finance minister went ahead and made a specific commitment that GST would be implemented from 1st April 2016. Uh, what that means is clearly it shows uh, government's resolve and uh, determination to get this particular tax reform by 1st April 2016. It is, it should be, uh, it throws up a huge amount of challenge for people, the executive which is implementing uh, <coughs> this this particular levy. There's a whole lot of activity to be done at, therein. As also uh, private sector assesses corporates uh, who need to kind of start now looking at what's the impact and getting themselves ready for this major change. It is going to be a major change. The second, uh, uh, announcement that he did on GST was that he uh, he pronounced this uh, this entire state of the art uh, indirect tax system and IT network that uh, they are going to put in place uh, and as of now again while a lot of our work is supposed to be done on that uh, they seem to be quite committed to this particular date of April 2016 so that's that's one big announcement going ahead on customs uh, while for uh, for service tax and excise uh, education says and secondary and higher secondary and higher education says has been kind of uh, subsumed into the main levy customs duty they have not done so it really means that the effective customs duty rate a uh, generic effective customs duty rate increases by about 0.5 percent uh, depending upon how the credits would be allowed and so on and so forth, this actually is an increase in customs duty rate and was possibly an increase in tariff barrier uh, effectively. The second uh, changes that they have made on the rate front is entirely to do with uh, their entire Make in India initiative <coughs> wherein conversion uh, duty incidences have been tried to be rationalized. The number of those kind of incidents are not, not many. Uh, they have they cover a part of electronic goods, uh, telecom equipment, uh, some bit of it, uh, and uh, also some other uh, commodities. On the central excise uh, uh, front, as I had mentioned earlier, excise duty and secondary, uh, I mean the uh, the education says has been subsumed within the excise duty. The effective rate is increased from 12.36 to 12.5 percent. Uh, there is some amount of reduction uh, in uh, duty rates uh, that uh, uh, that has happened uh, primarily again from the Make in India initiative, but by and large the excise levy as such has been kept uh, in place. Uh, there are not many major changes on the rate front. On the petroleum duty, uh, rates were uh, rate structures were uh, restructured a little bit. 
uh, were changed a little bit, but the effective incidence has been kept in place. Primarily, uh, the, it appears that this has been kept in place to uh, allocate part of that uh, cesses uh, to uh, uh, to a particular road fund that uh, that has been created. Uh, and there is a clean energy cess uh, on coal has been increased from 100 to 200 per ton. Uh, on service tax is where uh, there is actually some big news. Uh, the rate of tax has been increased from 12.36 to 14 percent. However, that is not the only news. What has also been proposed is there is going to be a, a Swachh Bharat cess that is proposed to be imposed. Uh, the 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 print suggests that it would be levied at two percent on the value of all or any of taxable services that would be notified in the speech. In the speech, uh, he had mentioned that these would not be liable to, or it appears that it would not be level levyable on all services, but certain notified services. But at least on those notified services, the effective tax rate would go up to fourteen to sixteen percent. This was, to some extent, expected by all in sundry, but this increase from 14 to 16 percent appears to be a huge, uh, that was unexpected. Uh, and uh, we'll need to see the fine print later as to which sectors will get included, if not all. The second big change uh, that has happened uh, is uh, they have uh, aggregators, which means that, uh, that service providers who provide through their app uh, and technology uh, act as intermediaries to get uh, get uh, service providers in place and if services are provided under a brand name uh, the aggregator is made liable to tax it it was primarily uh, sought to cover uber kind of services or a, or uh, let's say ola kind of services but uh, but this uh, particular levy seems to have not only covered those uh, uh, rent a cab services but also others and so again fine print what what they mean by this will need to be will need to be seen. This change is, hap is happening uh, from first of March, from tomorrow itself. <coughs> Negative list and exemptions have been pruned, uh, and again there is a lot of impact on the in the final uh, fine print. Uh, any services provided by the government to uh, business entities is now not included in the negative list, but would would uh, be liable to service tax on a reverse charge basis on corporate entities. Uh, while it is an innocuous kind of change earlier, only support services and the intention was to only cover those services which otherwise private sector provided, provides to corporate entities uh, uh, to be made liable to service, uh, service tax. But now it is all services and, and what is the ambit of this term all services would need to be seen. Does it impact license fees, spectrum charges? all of those would need to be evaluated. Uh, and so that I, uh, that's a huge, huge uh, uh, change and uh, clarity, clarity, clarity is required on this. Um, amusement and entertainment uh, events earlier not taxed primarily because it's liable to uh, these events and access to these events are liable to uh, entertainment taxes at the state level. Uh, specified amusement and entertainment events are now are liable to service tax at a 14 percent, of course, uh, from the enactment date and the date to be notified. Uh, and so that's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a big impact on m &E sector. Uh, construction contracts uh, for ports and airports earlier uh, not liable to tax would now be liable to tax. Uh, maybe it's because anyway ports are eligible to uh, provide uh, uh, I mean tax and have an output tax liability, but in, in case of construction, whether the service tax charged on immobile properties, uh, uh, whether that uh, credit would be available would need to be seen. So this is again a, uh, this is a big impact. Uh, again services or mutual fund agents and distributors early was taxable from the negative list. Uh, these were specifically exempted, but have again been brought uh, under the service tax net. Uh, again. Uh, the logic of getting these uh, would need to be seen. Uh, there are some uh, uh, some relaxations that the industry was wanting has been granted. Uh, there was an exemption. There was a huge. There was some amount of dispute 
for uh, film exhibitors uh, being charged service tax on certain kind of arrangements of exhibition of movies, uh, this exemption has been brought in and that's, that's, a, that's a relief for them. <coughs> What's been excluded or removed is immunity if you could show reasonable uh, cause, immunity from penalty if you could show reasonable cause, that's been withdrawn. That's a, that's a bit of a negative. On Senvet credit uh, front, uh, the eventual re removal of education and secondary higher education cesses, how will it kind of impact Senvet credits and how will it uh, uh, avilmen? Uh, that's uh, needed to be kind of looked at. What about the balances? That would need to be seen. But there are some relaxations in the last budget. Uh, the quantum of service uh, credit, the time of limit for availing credit had was reduced to six months from the date of the invoice. That's been relaxed on industry demand to ten uh, uh, to a to a to a year. That's that's good news. That was uh, genuinely required. Uh, again, uh, uh, what's been included now? Are, uh, as is one aspect uh, wherein if you have taken credit uh, but not utilized it uh, for the last two, three years, uh, that wouldn't trigger off any recovery uh, or demands. Uh, you needed to actually utilize uh, credit wrongly taken for a demand to kind of arise. Uh, now uh, the position is gone back to the position that was three years back where they could initiate recovery proceedings for credit taken but not even utilized. It means that interest could be payable and so one would need to be that much more careful in claiming the credit. Uh, again, uh, generally credit on uh, reverse charge and partial reverse charge uh, uh, can be availed on, uh, on payment of service tax on effective 1st of April 2015. Value of service to be paid uh, within uh, within three months of the date of the invoice, and reversal is genuinely not required now. So that's a relaxation. That's that's good. Uh, then there are certain common changes which, which are primarily, I think, driven by ease in administration, certainty, uh, giving certainty to people. Uh, there are rationalization of procedures for registration uh, and uh, digital maintenance of invoices uh, has 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 been introduced. Uh, there is rationalization of penal provisions uh, generally uh, wherein and this entire driver for this rationalization is to incentivize uh, assesses to close out on issues uh, earlier on. And advanced uh, advanced ruling uh, mechanisms have been have been extended to even specified forms. So that's that's good news. Uh, that's it for me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uday, uh, for you know the on from an industry perspective, the first one we watched the uh, uh, the finance minister's speech together earlier in the morning. The news was that there is a phased reduction of corporate tax rate uh, to 25 percent in the next four years. No mention at all about any increases immediately. Then we see the fine print, and there is an actually an increase in the effective corporate tax rate. What's your reaction to this? You think this is really intended? Was it frankly kept under wraps, uh, you know, somehow, or is this unintentional and perhaps uh, you know has been uh, you know has been brought in uh, uh, by mistake? Uh, the first issue was we we were both debating whether it's immediate. It's for this year. It's for 15-16 right. accounting year. It's not for 15-16. Right. It appears it definitely is for 16-17 onwards. True. The next was we were obviously curious to know what are the exemptions which will be withdrawn. We don't yes, know. Yes. Uh, Pranay took us through a whole host of Make in India initiatives. The common theme amongst all of them is it affects the foreigner. You know, you spoke of REITs, you spoke of MAT, uh, FII being uh, uh, exempted from, from tax on its capital gains, even for MAT purpose. GAR to an extent affects everybody else, but yet GAR was almost so, we were almost so certain and so overconfident <laughs> that it will come true. I'm not, I'm not being critical of this. I'm saying that all of this was needed. Fund management for years on end, we used to struggle to uh, effectively beat the system by saying that, you know, you are actually running it from India, but you're saying that it's run from abroad. Uh, all of our tax advisors used to advise us how that is supposed to be done. Uh, but. You know, I mean, what is in it for the Indian? 
I don't see I don't see anything which really affects the Indian, except for this big hope that our rates of tax will come down right. to twenty five percent. And considering that we've had a mat, the exemptions also in any case were restricted to roughly a twenty percent regime. Yeah, you're right, uh, <coughs> Sudhir. I mean, there is always a little bit of a fine print. I don't know why this couldn't have been mentioned right up front. Uh, like all of us heard of the fact that we will not pay insignificant amount of well tax if at all we were paying it, exactly. but we will pay a huge amount in the in the two percent additional surcharge. Fortunately, the finance minister did not mention the number of SSEs uh, <laughs> who would be liable to the two percent. Maybe this finance minister felt bad about it, as opposed to the earlier one who was very, who kind of very nonchalantly mentioned some forty thousand or thirty thousand SSEs. Forty-two thousand. Forty-two thousand, some odd figure. Everyone remember seems to remember it. I hope it has gone up, and I sincerely, as a citizen of this country, would like that number to be much, much, much higher. I just cannot imagine how it can be as low as that forty odd thousand number. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that brings us to the other point, right? This uh, it seems a first of its kind law is now being talked about, uh, anti-black money law. We of course had the Benami uh, Transactions uh, Act 1988. Uh, not sure how effective that has been. Uh, but you know, in, when it comes to a uh, uh, black money law, and we'll come back to some service tax issues, for example, where you had some very, very, uh, you know, uh, penal rates of interest prescribed in the last budget. Uh, the concern always is that the intent is good, but if the law is so draconian and, and, and more importantly, if the interpretation or if the language of that is open to various interpretations, how do you, what is the check and balance? You want to, you know, enable, as you said, make in India, at least not have disablers and you have this very noble intention of trying to crack down on black money. You, what's, what's your sense, you know, is, is it something which the government will be able to pull off without uh, you know without avoidable controversies i wouldn't put the other one of the service tax interest rate on on par with the black money right, i think right. this is something which all of us had been kind sure. of telling the government there's so much money outside india sure, sure. the fmb himself said that whenever there's a list announced or revealed yes. uh, by by somebody there's always an indian or a, a whole sure. host of indians in it so this is something which definitely needed to be done it's a sure. question of the enforcement sure. to what extent it is going to happen Plus, of course, the fact in today's day and age of uh, of information, there is so much information floating around, or either uh, revealed rightly or wrongly, or whatever. But I mean, that information needs to be used. Sure. Yes, I, these kind of laws will always have an extremely strict uh, kind of right. compliance or non-compliance uh, uh, penalty. We. In the past, people always used to say, "Who has ever gone to jail?" Right. But I'm sure this, these are Absolutely. things which will happen in the future, <coughs> and rightly so, they should. You know, because I mean, if you have one set of people who are the honest taxpayers who pay their taxes, and somebody else manages to beat the system, yes, the, the law should definitely be much much stricter against him. Correct. You know? Correct. You know, no, somebody paying a little less tax and he pays a little less interest. Yes, that is, I and suppose, the point. And it should serve as at least a, a very uh, credible deterrent when you have such uh, you know strict provisions. Uh, so you know that to that extent, yes. So if I come to you, Dr. Shivastava, you know this point about uh, anti-black money measures. Obviously, one is trying to uh, <coughs> see uh, an increase in the tax base uh, because that's the and you you pointed out some very important statistics that without increasing the tax base, where is the money going to come from, and how will you have your fiscal discipline? There was a lot of this expectation with the Jandan Yojana and the direct benefit transfer that you will hear something more bolder on the subsidies front. Uh, what it appears is that uh, it besides an increase in coverage on scholarships and on the on the gas cylinders, uh, at the moment it's status quo, is that right on subsidies? No yeah, change at I all? I think effectively it is uh, status quo. Uh, last year it turned out to be about 1.9% of GDP and this year what is planned is about one8 Right. So it's a very marginal gain. That's uh, one, but even in terms of the uh, of the of the administering of the subsidy, there is no change. It's going to uh, be in the conventional way, or that's not clear. Uh, that is not clear. Right. I think it will have to be very gradual because it has not been spread out. Right. The expenditure management commission was supposed to come up with the necessary strategy for this purpose. Okay. I understand that they have made their recommendations, mm -hmm. but uh, there is no explicit mention of that strategy in the budget speech. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. The other point, and I will come to Uday in a minute, you know, you rightly pointed out that the buoyancy which is assumed based on an increase 
in collections. Now, if I if I got it right, you were saying that indirect tax collections estimate estimated increases 24 to 25 percent yes. on a nominal GDP growth of 11 percent. Right. And, and 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 as an economist, what do you think? You know, what would be the basis if everything goes well as planned? What is the basis of making such an assumption? Is it just better compliance? Is is that the assumption? Uh, I think the only possible basis for this is some very small marginal increases in these tax rates. For example, the service tax rate the two percent uh, and, and two plus uh, two exactly four uh, actually. So yeah. to fourteen percent. So right. from twelve point three six to fourteen percent and maybe some more. Well, as Uday said, it's actually sixteen, right? Effectively, so it actually is a four percent increase. Yeah. So well. that. Maybe that the reason the for the service tax and for union excise duties, it's a very marginal increase in the right. in the core rate. Right. Uh, whether that will justify this kind of buoyancy assumption, right, uh, is to be seen. Right. But my own sense is that none of this will transpire mm -hmm. because when you increase the tax rates, the tax bases tend to go down, mm. and the net e impact is not the kind of buoyancy that you mm. wish to see. Mm. And therefore, the story of the current year may be repeated in the forthcoming years. Unfortunately, yeah. right. Uday, on let me come to you. You know, two points here. One is this rate uh, which you which you alluded to. Is it some kind of a signal to a uh, uh, towards a GST neutral rate? That is the other sort of rumor, if you like, emanating after the budget speech. That it's a preparation also to say that you know the revenue neutral rate uh, would be a little higher than what perhaps people wished it would be. And the second point I mentioned earlier, this uh, this 30% this rate, which was really a, a surprise and a bugbear of industry. Any attempt has been made to clarify that only unjust enrichment will attract 30% or is it even bona fide interpretation issues will still attract that 30% because that's the other concern that you have measures like this, which will serve as a so-called weapon to increase taxes in, in years when you have this buoyancy problem. So I'll, I'll take the first rate right. uh, question first. Uh, one, uh, the, what's expected on the GST front? Everybody expected the rate to grow up, right? And rate to go up from 12 to 14 percent, right? Uh, there was some talk about a cess coming in, but uh, but everybody was quite hopeful that given the fact that there is a, such a move to ease in administration and so on and so forth, one doesn't include cesses. Uh, and just kind of subsume everything. Right. Uh, the Swachh Bharat says uh, coming in and 2 percent on the overall tax that uh, is going to be collected, I mean amounts to a huge amount of money really. I mean service tax today collected net the cash amount after claiming credits is about a couple of lakhs and you have kind of that's amount on a 12 percent base this is 2 percent so it's around 20, 25,000 crores if they seek to impose it on all the services. Right. Uh, and so nobody expected and yeah, I think or from a GST perspective 12 to 14 was clearly expected. Mm -hmm. The rate of tax, you are right, I think there seems to be some logic because now the revenue neutral rate on services is expected generally speaking to be slightly higher or much higher the way you look at it from 16 to 20 percent. Uh, and maybe this is something to acclimatize people to get mm. their, uh, their expectations in order. Uh, I don't know which, whether it was this was entered. I don't, I, I think what we will also need to kind of see is whether this 2 percent is going to get imposed on all services. Uh, the more they increase, I, uh, I entirely agree with, uh, with doctor, is the fact uh, that the moment they increase, uh, this, the quantum of evasion especially for services uh, may actually go up. And so they might actually look at only certain kinds of sectors where organized players and so on and so forth. So uh, this so is not across the board. This two percent is not. While across the, board. the print print <coughs> is slightly weird. Okay. The print. So uh, it's not clear. It's not clear. It's, okay. Yeah. And what about the thirty percent? Thirty percent. There's no clarification. There's as of now there is no distinguish. Right. Uh, so it, there's absolutely no no yeah. change from last yeah. year, which is a bit of the disappointment. Yeah. It, it, right? it is. It is. It is extremely uh, kind of retrograde. Sure. Sure. Uh, they have done that with penalties. Hmm. I think what they have done with penalties as of now mm -hmm. is, is very, very uh, appropriate. What interest is anywhere hmm. given hmm. and that kind of risk to hmm. take even for bona fides, I right. think is just an especially when they are paying right. only 6 percent on refunds. Okay. 
But now let me come to you, you know, one point you covered in, in, in your presentation uh, on the poem. And you know, this is, goes back to FM statement that now we will bury, officially bury the direct tax code. Everything from there has been imported here <coughs> already. Uh, no, no word, however, on, on CFC looks like, so not That's sure right. uh, whether that is also buried with the DTC. That's one. And second, when you talked about the poem, uh, you know, is it, is it that this definition will now be applicable to foreign companies alone? Or is it the change in the definition of residency of companies per se? Because I think that is what the DTC at least intended to do. Right. So, uh, so the way it works is section 6 says that in two situations a company will be regarded as resident in India. The first is if a company is incorporated in India. Right. It will be regarded as resident. So that remains. Period. Wherever it is controlled and managed from under the domestic law. Absolutely. An Indian incorporated company is always resident in India. So the place of management becomes irrelevant. Right. And then we have a situation where what is left with other is other than an Indian company, which hmm. means a foreign company. There the current provisions of section 6A, it will be regarded as resident only if it is wholly controlled and managed. Right. Instead of that, the proposal under the finance bill is that it will now, a foreign company now will be regarded as resident of India if its place of effective management is. Okay, okay. So that's how. Which is on the lines of what the DTC, the DTC had DTC. originally proposed, but no word on uh, CFC. No word on CFC. So right. hopefully that is not only buried, but also forgotten. <laughs> okay. So that you cannot bring it back on the surface. Right. So let me come to you, Farooq. You know, as a uh, as an Indian group, you know, we remember discussing this uh, provision like poem at that time when it was proposed in the DTC. Uh, do you do you have concerns on the subjective application of such a provision? Having said this, you know, we know that in the UK, for instance, there is a similar rule which talks about effective management. But for an Indian multinational operating all across, in practical terms, do you do you see that uh, this could create uh, some areas of ambiguity? I would be concerned. Yeah. I would be concerned also from a perspective that we have not thought of it in this manner. Right. You know, you may be taking, you may be having meetings here, you may be doing video conference meetings, right. taking decisions here. Right. And there is no denying the fact that the ultimate managing director, the CFO is of the holding company, so he does sit out here. Right. Uh, a lot more uh, uh, cleaning the house would be required to right. ensure that I mean this <coughs> I'm, and I'm not referring to those cases which are actually run from India sure, sure. I mean you have large businesses which operate outside India sure. and those are the ones you would be worried about because uh, uh, there would definitely be an attempt of the of the tax officer a to test whether it was uh, uh, effectively run from India but uh, one only hopes that the implementation of that is in a fair and a transparent manner where mm. the essential substance has to be outside India not a fact that Mm. You had uh, a couple of memos went out from here, taking some decisions, sitting out here. Mm. Mm. Uh, those are the areas because I mean it's always the implementation which one is very worried about in this country. You know? Correct, and therefore one would say that you know if you are talking of operating subsidiaries outside of India, and, you know, one can try and define those uh, operating subsidiaries in a manner of speaking. Uh, then hopefully a provision like this is not meant to apply to such situations. Uh, and, and, and then how do you ensure that again guidelines are issued in to the effect that you know tax officers don't become over serious on the flip side at, at that time when we were debating this provision I mean people said are you really then going to encourage more board meetings to happen outside of India unfortunately just to steer clear of this uh, kind of a provision and and that is not something which is uh, which is is not intended and, and what do we achieve? You know, we just have more people traveling outside of India to nearby countries. You know, and what's your view on the on the control foreign corporation rules? Those don't seem to have been uh, uh, brought in, and DTC we are said is buried. So we see that at the end of uh, the debate on CFCs. Then I think so. That was almost the last of the big big right. picture items in the DTC. Right. Right. Barring the initial mat tax, which was on assets. Right. Which right. It, which I think has definitely been buried. Right. So this C CFC, as you rightly mentioned, was the last item. Poem right. one is one is very worried again. Correct. Very worried in the sense one will have to learn how to get one's act sure. in order, house sure. in order. Sure. Uh, and he took the opportunity also to uh, acknowledge the uh, receipt of all the four reports of the TARC uh, on the tax administration side, and at least there was a statement which said that we are going to consider implementing uh, wherever practical. Any any thoughts on you know from an industry perspective? What are the things you would like going forward uh, on the administration side for the government to consider? 
out of these reports? Well, frankly, one has reached a stage where it is only administration now which, which is right. going to matter. You know, right. I mean, if you go through this, in the in gone are the days when one looked for a little tinkering in the depreciation right. rate, some additional right. uh, or relief. Or commas or full stops. <laughs> some 80, some 80 with an appendage uh, section. You know, those Correct. one is one is one has gone beyond that, and and rightly so. The FM talks of going to a 25% uh, regime and right. uh, very close tax. to your bad rate of tax. Finally, it's going to boil down to administration. Right. The right. of course a very positive move we saw after Vodafone four. Right. The, the the press note or the cabinet uh, decision which they had taken and also they hmm. elucidated it ever so well in that uh, uh, in that press note the key points which came out out of the Bombay High Court decision have been brought out which hopefully uh, in similar cases will be used and uh, relied upon by SSEs and accepted by uh, assessing officers, commissioners, tribunals, etc. Uh, one would like to see much more of that. Uh, let's 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 hope. Let's be very positive. That this is a new beginning which has happened. Uh, I was also happy to find the, the the finance minister, though from a different party, uh, referring to the DTC and giving it sort of in a very decent, complimentary <coughs> manner. You know, right. it a wasn't that manner. conflicting way. <laughs> yes, you know, that's anything which was done by a previous government is wrong. You know, right. it was right. It was a very uh, bright uh, manner in which it was. It it's came very out. mature approach, yes. uh, uh, non-partisan approach in. Uh, uh, Dr. Srivastava, on you know he this announcement on gold monetization, uh, and and again there's a uh, some interesting debate around what what could this mean, and how much uh, would it uh, succeed in driving you know uh, gold deposits away from the non-productive side to the productive side. So again, uh, uh, Subedar and we were together in the morning, and one discussion was would it encourage let's say you know temples in India have a lot of. Uh, what you call gold metal as opposed to jewelry. They have jewelry as well, but a lot of gold metal. Would, would, would an attractive gold monetization scheme, uh, you know, ensure that a lot of that gold uh, sort of gets exchanged for the bonds they are talking about? I mean, what is as an economist, what do you see the positive coming out of this move? Uh, yes, the, definitely the idea is to release resources which are caught up in investment in valuables as well, which has become a good part of our investment story. Okay. To release that and then it uh, goes into productive investment. Whether uh, the holders of such physical gold in terms of the religious places or in terms of households would be attracted to move to start to earn income by investing in the gold related equities and whether this will be an effective augmentation of the overall investable resources is to be seen, but I think uh, they have thought about similar ideas earlier. In, uh, in one way or the other, all of those failed. I see. And uh, therefore, whether this will have a major impact or not is difficult to see. In your view, what could they think of designing it differently to make it? Is it just the interest rate part? It has to be a higher in return okay. of this. Okay. And if the return is something like 10, 12 percent, maybe people will be attracted. But it also means higher borrowings for the government, right? What does it do to your fiscal discipline then? So it's, it's irony, right? If it is successful, that means more borrowings for the government. So are we talking of government balance sheet being burdened here or is it is it going to well, be if, off the balance if, sheet? If, uh, if uh, the funds become available to some of the more specialized of the main fiscal uh, deficit account mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, certain uh, funds that are going to be set up who may be uh, lending directly to investors so that it is not a borrowing by the government but, uh, but by these uh, specialized SPV kind of, SPV kind of vehicles. So then it may not become part, directly become part of the government unless it chooses to borrow from that fund. Uh, so uh, it may become more generally available to investors. To that extent it may be useful. But if it becomes uh, available only to the government for borrowing, then it's just switching the source of borrowing. That, that doesn't and that would not be... Uh, of and how does it work? At the end of the term you are supposed to return the gold back to the original Yes, holder? if the holder of the bond were to ask the government or, or the body that floated that bond right. to, uh, to redeem it, then mm. he will, uh, then they will have to give so somebody the will physical gold. So the SPV or the government will have to store that gold? Yes, right? that gold will have to be stored. The expectation mm. is that any one point of time only a percentage mm. 
Hmm. Small percentage of such requests will come. Sure. And therefore, they would be able to generate a multiplier kind of effect out of this. Okay. okay. So I isn't mean, it that at the end of the period on redemption, there would be at best a choice available to the bondholder to get the gold or cash. And the hope is that he will opt for equivalent cash yes. of the value of gold at yes. that time. Yes. In which case you actually unlock what was gone and locked up as an investment into gold by the time the redemption comes and unlock it into cash or, or you know more productive usage. Would there be a that balance? balance and second, of is the timing this time slightly better in the sense that gold prices haven't appreciated too much interest rates now we have real positive interest rates real interest rates have been positive so the urge to invest in financial productive investments and and, and channelize saving that way is the timing a little yeah, i better? think the timing is quite appropriate uh, last two or three years there has been very heavy investment into physical gold which remained unproductive and therefore subdued our uh, growth stimulus so to that is to bring it at par with productive investment i think is a good initiative only if it becomes effective sure. and does not add to government's fiscal deficit per sure, se. Sure. Well, Sorry, you made a point? Yeah. would this improve our balance of payment situation? Because to that extent, that much less gold would be imported because we are a very gold hungry country. Uh, well, if, if the <laughs> circulation of gold uh, becomes such that domestic gold demand can be satisfied with domestic gold availability then it might improve the balance of payment situation. Of course, we don't have a balance of payments pressure right now as long as the oil prices remain weak. And uh, But as long as that kind of switching is possible, the, this uh, demand for gold being satisfied by imported uh, supplies would be abated. Okay. So, but the only thing I would ask is there would be no immunity. In short, if a person were to deposit X quantity of gold, he will have to show that that was shown in his books and so on and so forth. So, in short, it is not bringing in unaccounted gold into, into the system because one will only have the possibility of, of surrendering I, or tendering I, I gold which yeah. is already on I the don't books. think he, I mean at least in his yeah, speech I, I, I don't not think uh, there was any immunity. So, so given <laughs> that factor, how much of the gold that is there in the official system which will get tendered but, in this particular. But Pranav, if you look at temples for instance, you know, and maybe uh, Farooq you could add to it that in terms of the provisions applicable to charitable trusts, uh, those are, I mean, those are accounted for. Of course. Uh, wealth of right. all charitable institutions including places of worship. And therefore, if those come out, it's, it it's hopefully is not uh, difficult to uh, substantiate the source thereof. Sure. But that will be still a small proportion. if. I'm not if, sure. If temples, you look at the I think total bucket, I don't know what no, percentage I, of that. I think it's is pretty high. I am told, you know. Yeah, there's one temple in Kerala. Some has a lot of gold. some temples do have a uh, considerable amount of stock of gold, which has been accumulated over the ages, right. and therefore there is definitely a very large stock of gold. Right. And uh, if that is exempt from any further scrutiny, and if they decide actually to invest sure. in such a scheme, then that may be an effective. So it should be seen now how, how it will be made yeah, effective. Yeah. Quickly, there are some questions, Pranav. I think if we can yeah. take the indirect transfer, uh, sure. and that that's a that's a very pertinent question. Effective 1 April 2016, clarificatory for ongoing assessments. And before you answer that, Pranav, are we right in assuming that as far as the status quo and retrospectivity is concerned, nothing changes? Nothing changes. The provision is as it was right. always. Right. So it is effective retrospectively. Uh, there was hope that the retrospectively, the res retrospectivity will be undone, Correct. but that has not happened. Right. Neither for the indirect transfer provision nor for the royalty FTS and so on the other amendments. Right. So the retrospectivity says. And that, as Farooq said, is still respectful not only of the previous finance minister but the previous to the previous finance minister as well. Okay. Very true. <laughs> now, coming to the question uh, specifically, the question is though the provisions are with effect from April 1, 2016, which means assessment year 16 17, whether they can be regarded as clarificatory and principles may be adopted for ongoing assessments as well. The way the provisions are sought to be introduced, they are only effective prospectively. Then, of course, one would look at each provision independently. I would feel that a provision like substantial being defined or being interpreted as at least 50% of the value comes from assets in India. 
provisions like those I would feel should be interpreted to be really clarificatory and applicable even to the past because the law in the past was also ambiguous and therefore we need some guidance anyways. There are some precedents interpreting that substantial anyways to, in sure. to, to, uh, to mean more than 50 percent. And therefore, in such cases, I think it will have a lot of persuasive yeah, value absolutely. and clarificative. But if you look at some of the other amendments as to whether it will apply to a minority shareholder holding less than 5 percent, now that seems to be a relief. That does not seem, seem to be a clarification of an ambiguity in the law. The law as it stood was clear that it applies to any and every shareholder, even a tiny shareholder. The fact that it might have been unreasonable or impractical is a different issue, yeah. but it, it did not seem to have an ambiguity. So, in those kind of proposed amendments, I am not too sure how much one would be able to say that these are clarificatory applicable even to the past. Fair enough. Then as regards the dividend uh, non-taxability, that will come through a CBDT circular. circular. That's right. So, one has to wait for that CBDT circular to see whether it will apply retrospectively as well. Normally one would feel that if the interpretation is of the law by the CBDT that this is what we meant, then for all assessments or actions which are happening after the date of the circular, one would hope that it sure. will be followed by the uh, uh, subordinate authorities of the CBDT. So, these are the three buckets I would place them in depending upon which provision of indirect transfer. The yeah. other question Pranav on, on MAT implications on yeah. exchange of shares for units. Uh, on the face of it that still applies? Oh yes, the, this was a demand of the industry that MAT implications should not apply, but there is nothing in the budget or the this finance This is of course bill. in connection with REITs. This right? is in connection with REITs that when the sponsor, if the sponsor is a corporate entity, when the sponsor moves his shares of SPV, the sponsor corporate entity moves the shares of the SPV to the REIT structure, while he gets exemption from the normal tax provisions. Does he get any relief from MAT? No, he does not. Hmm. The representation expectation of industry was that this budget will give some relief, but that has not okay. come true. Okay, okay. And that uh, is because you will value your, sh your 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 units at the f at the fair value. So when I you move a profit, when a corporate sponsor, if the sponsor is a corporate sponsor, that's when we are talking of this MAT. When the corporate sponsor moves the SPV shares at say a value of 100, whereas his cost in his for his tax purpose as well as his books is say 10. For tax purposes, the profit is exempted. For book purposes, he also makes a gain in his books. And assuming that gain is actually coming on to the books, will the corporate sponsor get relief from MAT? That was the real question. The representations were to the effect that you are exempting in principle that particular movement. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you should give relief from MAT as well. But that was the ask of industry. But this finance bill does not really yeah. give any relief from a MAT perspective. Okay. Okay. Today on the on the inverted <laughs> duty structure, the question is: Has it really addressed all the anomalies? At least in the speech, it seems that it's across the board. Customs, SAD, uh, everything is taken care of. Is it as as simple as it as the speech sounded? No. I mean, short answer, short is, answer no. is no. Okay. No, but having said that, I think the intention is very much there. <laughs> right. Uh, 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 the the general understanding is that you don't need to really wait for the budget <coughs> for making this change because what are these? These are just changes in duty rates. They mm -hmm. can be made any time. Uh, and so, if the intention is there, I think I would be hopeful that they would look. So, no, at the ch rates have not been changed. You mean to say? So, the rates have been uh, reduced by reduced. Yeah, by exemptions and so on right. and so forth. So, will and it anyway, not once help? You're reducing the rate. Yeah. You can just do it by exemption notifications okay. or reducing rates or okay. kind of. And so, one would <laughs> hope that uh, the industry could continue to kind of identify those issues. And there are several instances which have not obviously been addressed here. Uh, uh, and they could do it and not. So, what is it that is budget. not addressed to there? What was the industry ask? His whole thing was about import versus, you know, you are incentivizing imports versus uh, encouraging manufacture in India uh, because raw materials for manufacture would, would, would be more expensive. Now, if he has reduced customs duty, hasn't he addressed that point? So, there are a couple of things. I'm right. Trying, the, the reason why I said not entirely right. is, is, is the fact that he has identified and gone ahead and try to rationalize some industry sectors. Okay. Where this so, it is not across the board. It is not across the board. Okay. 
uh, it covers the sectors which people had asked for or it is only covering them? I think some of the sectors. Okay, not all. Okay. 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 There are several instances, even the manufacturing and the services sector both. Right. Where there still exists some amount, or there is a case for a for uh, suggesting that there is inverted duty structures, there mm. are credit mm. uh, uh, issues which are rem uh, remaining, there are actually certain provisions which are which bear no logic and are creating the inverted right. duty structures in both sectors. Right. And one would think that uh, they rationalize it because they genuinely do not require a change in law, they could do it any time mm. and while budget is a good occasion to do some of it, mm. the rest of the year also is a good enough occasion I would think. Right, right, right. Farooq, from a, uh, coming back, you know, from an industry perspective, uh, there is an across the board increase, you know, in uh, the service tax rates. Uh, indirect taxes, as we know, are passed through. They again go ultimately to, there is a question also, you know, commercial vehicles do become more expensive in a manner of speaking or could become more expensive because of this. Uh, how do you see this challenge from a business standpoint? You know, uh, the FM acknowledged that investment climate is turning for the better, business is turning for the better. He talked about Unlike last year, he had at least one couplet this year in his budget speech. He talked about you know more flowers and uh, than uh, you know than obstacles. But this on the ground uh, will it not lead to a, one a greater challenge when demand is not yet fully caught up? Is is our understanding? And two is if you are able to pass through in a simplistic manner, it could add to inflation, which is what maybe doctor can comment on after we hear your views for it. It makes your product more expensive. Right. Finally, it means it's exactly. that, that's. So it's more difficult to sell. You know? Exactly. And uh, I, I don't know whether demand has picked up or it is just right. beginning to pick up. You know? Right. Right. Yeah, the very and early early signs, but we really need a yeah, lot yeah. of momentum to happen on that. You know? Right. And therefore, you know, uh, Dr. Srivastava, is it is there an assumption of you know somebody referred to a pact with the Reserve Bank of India, the Monetary Policy Pact, linked to CPI? I mean, obviously, it's a tightrope walking he seems to be doing. Yeah. But then, yeah. are, uh, you know, is he, has he assumed that hopefully there will be this phased reduction in interest rates, which everybody is hoping, uh, which will, you know, uh, add to the demand side and absorb some of these increases, which, as Farooq said, are inevitable uh, if you are going to increase indirect, uh, indirect duties. Yeah. Yeah, there will be definitely a cost side push. Right. Uh, uh, this increase actually is linked to the whole idea of GST right. and uh, reaching to GST it, comes hopefully with a very clean uh, credit system, right, for input credits, uh, unlike the current excise service tax uh, misalignment which exists. I would hope the intention is that. Right. At the ground level, I suspect the uh, execution on GST. So we'll have a separate GST debate on yeah. GST yeah. when it but comes. But on the but question yeah. of demand stimulus, <coughs> demand has not really picked up yet. Right. The year is ending when the consumption demand is growing at about 7 to 8 percent. Mm. Investment demand is growing at about 4 percent. Mm. And export demand is growing at less than 1 percent. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is definitely no demand pickup. We, I do not see the sign of any demand stimulus coming out from this budget, constrained as they are from the revenue side. And they are beginning with a very negative mm. uh, starting point mm. where actually they suffered a massive revenue so what will, so, sorry, so what will pick up, so that point again got debated earlier in the day when we were together uh, in the chamber and the question was what is it and, and maybe I allude back to what Farooq was trying to say that what is it in, in concrete terms in terms of making India or making demand pick up uh, in this budget, you know, is, is, are there signs like this which you see in the budget? Uh, from uh, the demand pickup is not really coming from the central budget. Sure. The expectation is that now that the states are receiving big one, transfers, right? huge, uh, they might be persuaded right. then to spend more right. on schemes that they themselves design and prefer. Absolutely. And they will have a larger capacity even to increase capital investment from right. their side. So right. that would be one. And then their expectation is that actually the inflation story is stronger. Mm. And uh, therefore, the stronger meaning more positive. Uh, inflation uh, is weaker. Inf inflation is weaker, right. and the story right. is stronger. Yes, yes. And therefore, the RBI would be persuaded right. to reduce the interest rate by something like 75 basis points during the course of the year, which will then induce the private sector demand to that's pick the, up. That's if I and sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> and therefore, uh, there are that's supplementary the actions that are to come from state governments and the household and the mm. private corporate sector.
for this story to go through, but sure. it's not going through from the central budget. Sure. Sorry, Farooq. From a crude perspective, uh, we've had we've had a dream year as far as this budget is concerned, I suppose, because of the fact that the prices have come down. And but they had also expected. There's a lot of expectation of it going back to seventy dollars. I mean, that's anybody's guess. Uh, what would you think the finance minister would have factored it factored his budget at? He would have used some assumptions. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Well, a I good think uh, people are expecting that it would be uh, in the range of 60 to 65 dollars, and uh, that is, is still uh, very beneficial for India compared to the kind of uh, crude prices that we have witnessed uh, in in the recent past. But the while the crude makes a direct benefit for government budget only as far as subsidies are concerned. It does have an uh, impact on inflation as a whole, uh, which has an adverse impact on anything that is ad valorem in our tax system. So when the inflation goes down, actually, right, e everything that is ad valorem, and that is the effect that we are seeing in terms of the oh. depressed revenues coming from union excise duties, and not only this, sales tax that is for the state governments. They states after states are saying mm. that they are now seeing depressed revenues because they are highly dependent on ad valorem tax rates and even their petroleum taxes are ad valorem. <coughs> and therefore, uh, there, is this dip, there is this adverse impact of this very beneficial uh, event that is happening. Mm. And the adverse impact is immediate. The benefits come later when demand of households pick up. There is always a so lag, right, in, yes, in that yeah, sense. Yeah. Which brings me to the other important point, uh, Dr. Srivastava, uh, to just round this up. Uh, at least in the budget speech, one did not find explicit mention of any uh, divestment revenues. Last yes. year, he did refer to it uh, in, in, in some ways obliquely, in some ways explicitly. Uh, when you talk about you know tax buoyancy challenge, will that not be a significant element uh, for? And I'm I'm not sure how, how, what is the budget. Well, what the, divestment the on on the divest divestment side, what is budgeted comes through what they budget as non-debt capital receipts. Right. There, there is no significant increase compared to what was budgeted so it is last 40, year. 40,000 crores around? Is uh, last year, what was budgeted was about 54,000 oh, crores, 54, okay. uh, which was not realized. So right. I am told that until January, only 24,000 crores were right. realized. Uh, and uh, therefore, he has not even mentioned it right. because it will have, they, he will then have to acknowledge right. that uh, they, uh, not met with. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they failed actually to translate right. that. So th he has, I think, something similar this in terms of relative to GDP is almost the same amount. Right. So on non-debt non capital receipts, he is budgeting 1.6 percent uh, to come through, and uh, which is something quite similar to what was budgeted last year. Hmm. So I would <coughs> think uh, that they are budgeting something like close to 70 to 75,000 crores this year. 70 to 75? Yeah. Okay, that that Windows has a backlog of this year and then and next and year. Uh, the next year. Yeah. That's that that's would so include also spectrum, <coughs> coal, and no, so on. No, the spectrum and the coal would yes. go to the state governments, and the spectrum, spectrum will come in non-tax revenues. Okay. So this would be mass mostly divestment only. Wow. Okay. Okay. Great. I think we are coming to the end of our of our time schedule. Farooq, any any concluding thoughts uh, from an industry perspective, and any change in mood swings from morning till now, as far as <laughs> you are concerned? <laughs> I wouldn't say mood swings. Uh, <laughs> I don't think the fine print has brought out anything really like a howler. Right. Uh, which is saying I a lot. The, you know, yeah. I think the direction which has been set of this 25 percent is what is very invigorating. It <coughs> will possibly keep us going uh, down the road. Right. Uh, considering that we've uh, the incentives were almost a thing of the past. We don't have too many of them. Maybe we will not lose too much. And in right. balance, I suppose it's not that we are going to pay less taxes. Uh, the finance minister obviously needs a, a larger revenue base and that is something which the the number crunching will be done. Uh, but I think it's it's just that that rate is, is so, so much more uh, acceptable as a rate. The world also will look at us as a less heavy taxed burden com country and with the, with the hope that uh, implementation of the tax regime will also be in a softer manner which I think one is as we spoke about some of the early early si signs we're seeing towards that. I, let's let's hope uh, on an let's let's try and end on an optimistic note that uh, one is the economists will ensure the demand revives, <laughs> and uh, which will help the 
uh, which will help corporate sector to produce more profits and uh, give more taxes to the government. Excellent, excellent. Now, any thoughts, any concluding thoughts? So, I mean, uh, there is some disappointment that there's not too much for investments in infrastructure, manufacturing, probably very direct. But the way I look at it is, he's saying, okay, the corporate tax rate will go down over a period of time. Invest today when you make profits, really, maybe in three, four, five years, you'll, you'll pay less. The other is, he's saying, no GAR for investments made till 2017. So invest immediately, that's the need of the hour, please invest now. So he's calling foreign investors to invest before March 17. Third is when it comes to again incentives, exemptions, they are going to be phased out. So if industry wants to invest into new projects, please invest quickly so that you get the exemption window open and it's going to get phased out. So I think he's trying to get investments immediately and over a period trying to balance the fiscal. Absolutely. I think what is clearly coming out is the finance minister seems to be telling uh, business and the people at large, both in India and abroad, that the train is uh, slowly moving, the, moving out of the platform, get on it pretty fast before it picks up speed and hopefully becomes a bullet train uh, as, 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 as everyone is hoping and as this government has uh, made its intention clear. Clearly, uh, all our panelists believe that uh, on balance there have been more flowers uh, coming back to the couplet uh, uh, Mr. Jetley recited uh, than uh, even, even, even when you read the fine print uh, than the obstacles. We do hope that is how it will pan out in the year ahead. We wish uh, the finance minister and the government all the very best as they go about improving uh, the collective lives of businesses and the people uh, of this country. Thank you for uh, joining in and we hope to keep our dialogue alive the year round on various topics uh, as they unfold. Thank you.